While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity, our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, He gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, He displayed His power and purpose. While we stood accused, He accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, He gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, He accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for His blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation, you are His child, His chosen. You are His beloved. to you my brothers and sisters good evening i greet you in the marvelous name of our lord and savior jesus christ thank you so very much for joining us on today as we celebrate the savior we listen to the seven last sayings of our christ as he hung on the cross for both me as well as for you i'm joined by a cadre of preachers who are the ministers of both Transformation and Scott AME Zion Churches. Tonight, you're going to hear from their lips. You're going to hear from their hearts. And I pray that you would encourage the preacher. We have, speaking the first saying of Christ, Miss Charlene Babin, as she will declare, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Following her, we will hear Mr. Adrian Howard, who shall preach, today you shall be with me in paradise. Following Brother Howard, we will have uh, the Reverend Rakim Elamin, who will preach 
Woman, behold thy son. After we hear words from him, we shall also hear the Reverend Bessie Walker who will say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? After she will preach, then we will hear the words from the Reverend Georgiana Welsh who will preach the saying, I thirst. We will also have the Reverend Dr. Geraldine Jones, Minister at Transformation, to share with us the words, it is finished. And finally, I will close it out with the final saying of Christ when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I pray that you will truly be encouraged, that you will be touched by the words that are shared with you on tonight, that the Holy Ghost will move upon your heart as we take a moment to remember, as we reflect upon this day, Good Friday, a day that is etched in the history of time as the day that Jesus died for both me and for you. Let us hear now some singing as we prepare our hearts for the word of God. God bless you.
Always ahead of my life to my pastor, um, Reverend R.J. Chandler, all my sisters and brothers in Christ. Today I'm going to be speaking from Luke 23 34, and it reads, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Dear Heavenly Father, as I come to you today, see less of me and more of you as I Attempt, dear God, to give this word, Heavenly Father. Father, open their hearts and minds and let them be receptive of your word, dear God. This is my prayer. Amen. <clears throat> Each year, many of us watch The Passion of Christ, this powerful movie that reminds us that the Lord Jesus, who's is the sustainer of our existence, just how much he loved us. In John 15, 3, during the Last Supper, he told his disciples, no one has a greater love than one who will lay down their life for a friend. And because of that, Jesus did just that the next day. He laid down his life on the cross. The scripture tells us that the ultimate proof of his love is when he died on the cross. Jesus loved us and he died to prove it. This passage reminds me of a song I once heard. Too many broken hearts fall in the river. Too many lonely souls drift out to sea. You lay your bet and you paid the price. The things we do for love. The things we do for love. Jesus died on the cross because he loved us and he paid the price. He willingly died because of his love for us. In the book of Luke, the scripture tells us that Jesus, immediately after he was nailed, Immediately after they nailed him on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. After Jesus had been up all night, he was betrayed by Judas, abandoned by his disciples, falsely accused of blasphemy, and he was turned over by the, his own people. He was mocked, scorned, beaten so bad you could barely recognize who he was. And his back was shed after being beat 39 times. But during all of this, what did he say? Nothing. <laughs> Not one word. They wrapped him in a purple robe with bleeding remnants of his back. They placed a crown of thorns, pounded it on his head. And they, to add insult to injury, they punched, kicked, 
and spit on my Jesus. And he was forced to carry the very instrument used in his own death. As the people, John, world, yelled insults at him while others was weeping as he passed by on his way to that place of scars. And for us, it's called Calvary. He was thrown on his back, stretched out, had iron nails pounded into his wrists and into his feet to secure him on the cross. And throughout all of this, what did Jesus say to his persecutors? Nothing. Nothing at all. And still, instead, Jesus called out to his heavenly father, Father, and what did he ask for? He didn't ask for the suffering to stop. He didn't ask to smite his tormentors. He didn't ask for strength for himself. No, none of that. Jesus asked his father to forgive the disciples for whom he walked with for three years and performed miracle after miracle. He asked for forgiveness of the leaders who falsely accused him of blasphemy and forgiveness for those who mocked and inflicted unspeakable pain and suffering unto him. He prayed. He prayed and went past that. He prayed, Father, forgive them for every evil thought, every mean word, every expression of hatred, every selfish act, all the outbursts of anger, the twisted motive, the smug acts of self-righteousness, Every skeleton in the closet. That means that he was forgiven every sin, known and unknown. But Jesus, in the midst of all this suffering, far beyond my comprehension, he asked his father to forgive those who crucified him. This reminds me of a hymn. Holy Jesus, how thy has offended. In the second verse it said, who was guilty? Who brought this upon these atlas of treason Jesus had undone? This is the Lord Jesus. I, it was denied thee. I crucify thee. But after being nailed to the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And right here, I'm going to put a pen in it. I'm going to tell my story. When, and I often talk about this. When I was in church, <laughs> and I gave my all in all to the church, to the members that are considered as families and friends and, and, and just prayer partners. And, but when that day came and they turned their backs on me, when they lied on me, when they falsely accused me, I stretched myself out and I called on the Lord and in the midst of my calling I told him father now I know how you felt when your people turned their backs on you I knew how you felt father because I was hurt and dismayed. But through all of that, 
Jesus never turned his backs on his people. And after they nailed him to that cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And Jesus was right. We didn't know what we was doing. But the good news is, God does. He knew exactly what he was doing when Jesus died on that cross. It was enough to forgive our sins because Jesus Christ, who John the Baptist said was the Lamb of God, take away all the sins of the world. It was John 1 and 29. And the scriptures go on and tell us if we confess our sins, who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and clean us of all forms of unrighteousness. And John 1 and 9 says, we are reminded of this in the word that he's the mighty God who pardoned and delivered us. His grace and his mercy sustain us. And through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we are saved. When we confess our sins, God gives us forgiveness. But what God is doing with this sin in the Old Testament, it gives us many examples of what God forgiveness looked like. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said, I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. He did this because he loved us. And as the apostle John wrote, in this love, not that we love God, but God loved us. He sent his only begotten son, so whosoever believed him and trusted him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. And when Jesus, in the midst of his agony, of crucifixion, a crucifixion prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. But I'm so glad that God answered that prayer because God loves us. The death of Jesus on the cross, he laid down the foundation of forgiveness of our sins. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Because justice would have rolled down like water and the righteousness would have streamed down like tears. But God's grace and mercy saved us. The scriptures tell us to act just, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God's love. God's affirmative action is bless the merciful and they will be shown mercy. Bless the peacemaker and they will be called children of God. And bless those who are prosecuted uh, because of righteousness and for there is the kingdom of heaven and forgive and give us hope this gives us hope I'm going to say it again this gives us hope in the midst of this pandemic because God is still sitting on the throne he is still wrapping his loving arms around us he is still protecting us. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that I have a Jesus who was willing to lay down his life for me and forgive me of my sins. I am so glad that I have the right to the tree of life. I am so glad. I am so glad. I am so glad that God is in my life today. I don't know about you, but when I see God's face, I want to be able for him to see a smile <laughs> and not a frown. This is my prayer for my sisters and brothers in Christ. Amen.
Bless all you beloved people, the ones who celebrate God. I call you my party people. Ah, let's rejoice in the Lord. Here, I always wanted to be a part of the seven last days, so I thank the Reverend Dr. R.J. Chandler and Transformation for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this and help me to grow. So we're here in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and it says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Praise be to God. Mm. Part of his seven last words here. Yeah. Jesus is on his road to Calvary right now. He got flogged. And he was along with two other criminals, as they say here. And they walked with Jesus unto Calvary. They were there to witness all the people that was there, the fanfare, the people who they heard about, this Jesus. Just now getting crucified and suffering. Ah. Some say he was flogged until he was unrecognizable in many ways. But we know that even though Pontius Pilate knew he was innocent, he flogged him anyway because he didn't, Pontius Pilate didn't want to face Caesar. And that's what he was threatened with by the Jews of that day. All right? Praise be to God. These criminals, they had choices at that moment. Were they thinking about themselves in a way of, how can I escape out of this? Oh, man, I got caught. Or, what? what have I done? And how can I be better? And so here, when they're putting them up on the stake, and their lives were at stake, um, they're hanging from the cross with Jesus. The one criminal didn't appreciate the moment. He's only thinking about himself. The other criminal was thinking like, man, don't you know who this is? And he, I'm sure he was saying to himself, this is his opportunity for redemption. And his heart was filled with forgiveness. He wanted forgiveness. He desired forgiveness. And so he lets the other one, other criminal know that's not the way. This man right here, he's the way, the truth, the light, the door to paradise. And so he approaches Jesus while he's on the cross. And he asks him for forgiveness and to be with him. And today, Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today, you out there may have done something that you are ashamed of. You may have done things or many things. These criminals probably led a life of, of criminal activities. I, when I was young, I had nothing. I felt like I was compelled. I had to steal. There was something in me. I used to take things that wasn't mine. And then I got away with it. At least I thought to another person, but God was there to see me. He ain't getting away with nothing. I did it for a long time as a youth. and never got caught by a person, or even if they did see me, they let me go. You know, you never know who's watching. And I had to face all those things. And it weighs heavy on my heart. I have to be compelled and look, look at all the things I've done when I was a kid. Now, and that man that was on the cross, he had a choice. He had the opportunity. And now, he chose Jesus. You too can choose Jesus. No matter what's going on. Today, Jesus said. So that means now, right now, today, you can change your ways. You can change your course. No matter what you've done. No matter what you said. Today, is the moment. 
That's what Jesus said today. And when you read it in the King James, the two and the day are separate. It's not one word. So when you were over there, now you come to this day with Jesus. And you'll be in paradise. And that criminal was the first person. No, it wasn't Peter. It wasn't John. It wasn't James. Yeah, it was a criminal. He's the first one in paradise with Jesus. He was the first. He was the last. And now he's the first. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. It's never going to change. It's always going to work the same because we have served the same most high God. Praise be to God. Today, be in paradise with Jesus. I ask it all in Jesus' name. I'm praying for you, your family, your friends, your community. I'm praying for you all. I'm praying for me, my family, my community. I'm praying for Scott. I'm praying for transformation. I'm praying for all the members and the new members, the children. I'm praying for the leaders, the leadership. I'm praying for the pastor. Now and forever. Today, we're in paradise with Jesus. In Jesus' name, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord on this good Friday. I'm going to come to you from John, the 19th chapter, 26 and the 27th verse. And it's coming from the St. James Virgin. And the reason is follow. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto the disciple, unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. And then he said it to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Amen. Amen. When I think about that topic, in keeping with the biblical injunction to honor one's parent, <laughs> in Exodus 20 and 12, <laughs> it says as one of the Ten Commandments that we must honor thy mother and thy father. Now see, he took that same oath on that day to honor her. I'm just only going to be with you just for a few more moments. First of all, he treated her with the deference that she was. Then he provided for her and looked after in her old age. So Jesus was honoring his mother. I can just imagine that day. There he was sitting there going through three phases the first phase was that i'm hanging on this cross honoring my father his second phase was that he is still saving souls even though he was preparing to die he spoke to the two that was on his left and on his right he said to the one on his left do you know me and he said to the one on your right, do you know me? And they both said to him, Jesus, why are they doing this to you? But he loathed that what he had to do. Now, in the scripture, it says that he told his mother, just behold your son. You see, I can imagine as he looked over that crowd of all the ones that said they was for him, but then all of a sudden they became against him. Now I'm gonna let you know something. Have you ever been there? You done done all you could for an individual on a father figure, mother figure, and then all of a sudden the children are looking at you like you are feeling dirt. But he told one of his disciples, one that he loved so much, Get my mother out of here. See, he wanted her out of there because he didn't want her to see what was going on. He didn't want her to go through the turmoil that he had to go to. That's like any parent. They don't want to see their child being executed on death row. 
They don't want to see their child being executed on the streets. They don't want to see their child huh, because he was in the street going around. See, what you should do right now is turn to 50 or 100 of your friends and family and sit down huh, and say to them, come on. Because you see, in keeping with the topic of the injunction, so on this Friday, Good Friday, I want you to grab that person and tell them this, it's Good Friday. And I can't act as though he didn't die for me, nor that he made it. Because in three days, he's gonna rise back. And his mother gonna be able to rejoice with him. So you see, Jesus was enough in pain to allow his mother to see any of that. I just want you to know, as I close, family and friends, that behold, honor that mother and father. Love your mother and father the way that you're supposed to love them. No matter what they may do, no matter what they may have said unto you, but I know deep down inside that the love they have when you're weeping there by yourself thinking whether you're incarcerated in your cell weeping whether you're at work weeping or you're sitting in the corner of your house and you're weeping and you're crying because mom then went on home see mom carried you in the belly of her womb for not just nine months but she nurtured you Everything she ate, you ate. Everything she done, you done. And as you came out, she still was showing you motherly love. You see, Mary was a mother. She was a mother all the way to the end. Because she loved her son. She didn't see no wrong. Just as we on earth don't see no wrong in our children. But I say to you, as we close on this Good Friday, just understand that weeping may endure for a night. Weeping may endure for a night. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy, joy, joy is coming in the morning. May God bless you and keep you. Why do you cry? He has risen. Why are you
preaching from Mark, the 15th chapter, the 34th verse, and it read as thus, and at this ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elo, Elo, Lama Shabbatni, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus went about healing the sick and the afflicted. He had a rough journey because some people spit in his face, beat him, called him names, ran him out of their cities, but he kept right on going. Jesus worked many miracles for people during his time here on earth. He came down to set an example for us and we are to follow, follow what he has done. 
Jesus gave us a new life and he gave us everything that we needed for to survive on this earth but sometimes we are hard-headed we do not listen or obey what he tell us to do but if you listen and obey Jesus you will not go wrong Jesus healed the blind he raised the dead and he healed the sick when Jesus said my God my God he had taken on the sins of the world and that's why he felt forsaken by God he took on your sins my sins everybody's sins and after all he said this is finished praise the Lord everybody praise the Lord for this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall Rejoice and be glad in it. My scripture will be coming from the book of John, chapter 19, verse 28. And my word is, I thirst. Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bring forth your word again, Lord God. And we ask asking you let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Thank you. John chapter 19, verse 28. And it reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Accomplished is to carry out or finish an action. To complete what you set out to do. Jesus said in the garden when he was praying, Thy will not my will be done. To accomplish a goal is to complete it. Jesus didn't say a mumbling word when he was going to the cross. You know, sometimes when we are going through something, we murmur and complain and don't want to do this or do that, but it said he did not mumble a word. Accomplish. Some who is considered accomplished have accomplished, accomplished a lot. Jesus. Remember when he got baptized? God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Accomplish. Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. The word is especially used to indicate that a person is very experienced. Hallelujah. God already knew what Jesus was going to do. He knew that he was experienced. He knew that he was skilled. And he was awarded in his skills. Everything that Jesus did, hallelujah, was for our benefit. Everything that he said was for our benefit. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. One of the scriptures is verse 24 in chapter 19. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not, let us not rend it. They was talking about his clothes, but cast a lot for it. Which it shall, whose it shall be, that the scriptures, the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said it, they parted my clothes, they did cast lots. These things the soldiers did. The scripture might be fulfilled. Chapter 19, verse 36. For these things were done, 
that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. The scriptures being fulfilled. Verse 37 in chapter 19. And again another scripture say, They looked on him whom they pierced. The scriptures were being fulfilled. There were in fact at least 20 New Testament prophecies fulfilled during the 24 hours surrounding the Lord's death. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, the scriptures were fulfilled. Jesus said, I thirst. Thirst symbolized in a verb longing, yearning, hankering, pining, hunger. Thirst means to have a strong desire for something. Jesus said, I thirst. One of the agonies of crucifixion was increased thirst, added to the terrible pain. He did take a sip of the sour wine, remember, but he didn't drink of the wine that was mixed with the gall. That was a drug. And Jesus wanted to suffer through everything, through his whole conviction, a crucifixion. He came to suffer on the cross for our redemption. He was thirsty. I thirst. But you know, I see another thirst in this. After Jesus, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said it. I thirst. Psalms 42, 1 and 2 say, As the deer panted after the water, so my soul panted after you. My soul thirsts for God, hallelujah, for the living God. When shall I appear before God? I thirst for you, Lord. I thirst. Psalm 63, 1 say, O oh God, thou art my God. Early shall I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for you. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I thirst for you. All the scripture was fulfilled and knowing God, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, he thirsted for God. Matthew 5, 6 say, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be fulfilled. I thirst for you, my Father. John 17, 1 say, These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour have come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify you. I thirst for you, Lord. I've been through. The whole scriptures have been fulfilled. I have accomplished everything that you have sent me here to do. John 17, 5. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I thirst, God. I thirst to come back home. Hallelujah. When I cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Hallelujah. I never felt this way before. I never was without you. Hallelujah. I thirst for you. John 17, 26. And I have declared unto them your name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. I thirst for you, Lord. Amen.
comes from John 19.30. And I'm asking God to touch us with his love, his mercy, yes. and his grace. You're already here, and we thank you for dwelling. Amen. The greatest love story ever told. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. The story, that great love story began in the beginning. In Genesis 1, 31 to 2, 1, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Amen. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, for it was finished. And the story, that great love story, continued after he breathed into life and made a living soul in the image of God. But not long after that, God's heart was grieved. He was sorry that he had even created humankind. Thereafter, however, he promised, and his promise was true. Never again would he destroy what he had made, what he had created, humankind. And the love story, as was prophesied, continues. Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God sent Jesus, his son, to save the world and to bring to his creation new life, new meaning, salvation, and to free us from sin, to love, to heal, forgive, and to bear our pardon. As the story goes, the war in heaven had sent evil to destroy and to conquer the world. In Eden, the trust had been broken and the enmity cast between the seed and the heel. Jesus came down from heaven joyously and voluntarily as his father asked of him. He wanted to be obedient to his father's command. What did he do while he was here on earth? He healed the sick, raised the dead, brought with him grace and mercy and fulfillment of the law. He went about his father's business, turned water into wine, cast out demons. The word was made flesh among us. And when he had opened the book, <laughs> he found the place where it was written, the spirit, hallelujah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, the love story reveals that Jesus had come to encourage us to be ready and to prepare to be ready when he comes back again for the coming of the Lord, to be ready with our worship, our obedience, and our praise. The greatest love ever everlasting and eternal love, love that will not die. As we review and relive that love story, 
we can profess that the ultimate price had been paid. The sins nailed to the cross. Jesus could proclaim to his father, I have told them that I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, mm -hmm. engraved at my death on the cross. I have told them, as you said, you sent me to tell them how much we will always love them. You sent me to preach the message, to let nothing separate or take them out of our hands. I've told them, you sent me to teach the new commandment to love one another. I've told them, you told me, you told me, and you said unto me, tell them, please tell them, tell them for me that I, I love them. Tell them, tell that lonely man who is walking all alone. Tell them, tell the brokenhearted, tell them. Tell the sin sick and lost, tell them. Tell the sick child, tell them. Tell the homeless, tell them. Tell the orphan, tell them. Tell the lost, the forgotten, tell them. Tell them, tell the motherless, the fatherless, tell them. Tell them. Tell them for me that I love them. So Jesus said, so my father, my God, I've done all that you assigned for me to do. Now I bow my head in obedience and agreement to come up yonder in that heavenly place where I will resume my seat at your right hand. It is finished. As it was in the beginning, it is finished. The strife is o'er, the battle done, the victory of life is won, the song of triumph has begun. Alleluia, mm. alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, would you join me as we look at Luke 23, verse 46, where it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. I want to speak to you from the thought, put it in his hands. Pray with me. You are the potter and I am the clay. Have your way, have your way. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Somebody ought to say amen. When I look at this passage of scripture, I must also look at the fourth saying of Christ when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, Jesus felt abandoned. He felt forsaken. But in the seventh saying, there's a reconnection. In the seventh saying, he says that he's going to commit his spirit unto the Father. Can I pause for a moment and reflect upon that fourth saying, because it troubles me. It troubles me because throughout the ministry of Jesus, we find that God, the Father, loved the Son. As a matter of fact, in the Matthew account of chapter 3, John baptizes Jesus, and the Bible says in verse 17, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. That was God's approving, anointing, and appointing Jesus for an assignment that was tailor-made for him. In John 6, verse number 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will.
will of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus understood that he was under authority and that his purpose was inextricably tied to doing the will of the Father. That meant that every miracle, every sign, every wonder that was performed was under the supervision and authority of God. For example, the Father was with Jesus when he turned the water into wine. The Father was with Jesus when he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. He was there when Jesus calmed the storm when he said, peace be still. The Father was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. The Father was there when Jesus was betrayed, ridiculed, mocked, hurt, and scorned. However, for three hours when the sun was removed from the earth and darkness permeated the atmosphere, Jesus screams the question, why has you forsaken me? For the first time in the life of Jesus, he asked the father why he forsook him. The Greek word for forsake is katalepo, which means to abandon, leave in straits or helpless. Why would Jesus ask this question when God had always been by his side? Why would he do this? Why would he ask this question when we find in the second saying of Christ, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Well, I think that it's more than Jesus just simply uttering Psalm number 22 verse 1 as a messianic fulfillment. I think that the question goes beyond Paul's second epistle to the church of Corinth, chapter 5, verse 21, that says he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Come on, stay with me. I think that the question is much deeper than the analogy that like a sponge placed in a basin of water, Christ absorbed our sin. He took on the sins of all generations generations past, present, and future. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus is asking a question that many of us have asked when we feel like our prayers are not being answered because out of approximately 30 million confirmed COVID-19 cases and 500 40,000 deaths. Perhaps there is someone asking the question, why has God forsaken us? That's when all hell breaks loose in our lives. It seems as if God is nowhere to be found. Now, that when our heart gets broken, God seems like he's too busy to fix it. When the pervasiveness of injustice and racism becomes the order of the day, God seems far removed from the plight of humanity. When I'm giving my tithe, attending Bible study, doing the work of ministry, when I'm doing the work of ministry, it seems that I got nothing but drama in my home, drama on my job, attack on my health, attack on my finances, loss of loved ones. For every step I go forward, I keep getting knocked back 10, 20, 30 steps. Uh, it's like I can't get a break. I can't go forward. Uh, and I find myself asking a question like Jesus as a, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? What do you do when you feel forsaken? What do you do when you feel as if you're back is against the wall. What do you do when you've cried your last tear and grown weary from the battle? What do you do when your so-called friends leave you? How do you handle the pain? How do you manage the agony? May I suggest, may I suggest that you do what Jesus did and simply Hang on in there. Hang on in there. I, I, I just came to encourage somebody that when you feel that God has forsaken you, just do what Jesus did and hang 
on in there because after a while, your disconnection from God will be reestablished. That's why Jesus was able to say in his seventh saying, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus is teaching us, even on the cross, that when we feel distant from God, all we have to do is reconnect through prayer and put it in his hands. What Put what, pastor? Put your fears in his hands. Put your anger, your depression, your anxiety in his hands. Put your trust in his hands. Can I call the roll? Job, come on over here. Job hung in there when his body was anguished with sores. The Bible says that his wife told him to curse God in Job 2 9. But he said in Job 13 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job put his trust in the Father's hands. Paul, come on over here. Paul hung in there even when he had a thorn in his flesh. The Bible says that Paul wanted God to remove it. But while we don't understand or know what the thorn represented, what we do know is that God refused to remove it. And he said in 2 Corinthians 12 verse number 9, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul put his faith in the Father's hands. I need you to put something into the hands of the Father. There was a little girl who rode on an airplane and it was filled with passengers. While they were thousands of feet in the air, the plane started to go up and down because it went into some air pockets, left to right, up and down. The plane jerked and people began to panic. The oxygen mass began deployed from the above the center council uh, of the airplane uh, so that everybody could get it uh, and people were in mass hysteria uh, people were crying uh, people were upset uh, people began to call on the Lord uh, but all while there was all of this commotion uh, there was a little girl uh, who was sitting uh, in her seat uh, and the stewardess looked at the people uh, and then looked at the little girl uh, and noticed while everybody is in chaos uh, she is remaining in order and after the plane came to equilibrium where there was no more panic the stewardess walks over to the little girl and said oh little girl little girl how is it that you remain so calm why didn't you lose your mind when everybody else was losing their mind the little girl said Oh, Miss Stewardess, I didn't lose my mind because I know who the captain of the plane is. It's my daddy. And my daddy said that as long as I'm in his hands, I will always be safe. I will always be secure. It's going to work in my favor. He said, I'm in his hands. It's going to work for my good. Whose hands are you going to be in? I dare you to put your life in the hands of the Father. Say yeah. Say yeah. In the name of the Father, Son, and Blessed Holy Ghost, put it in his hands. Put it in his hands. My brothers and sisters, we always have to open the doors of the church and give an invitation to Christian discipleship. For that is why we do what we do. And so there may be somebody who have been blessed by the seven last sayings of Christ on tonight that you want to recommit, rededicate, 
or simply you want to get saved. All my brothers and my sisters, come on, let's get saved on tonight. My number is on the screen. You can put your information in the chat, put it in the comment section, and let's connect my brother and my sister. Oh, the Lord has truly blessed us. And as we celebrate this night, Good Friday, oh goodness, it, it, it's good because the Lord decided to become the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Ah, it, it, it's good, my brothers and sisters, that he would die for both you and for me so that we could live. My brothers and sisters, I'm grateful for Jesus. I'm grateful for his love for all humanity. I'm grateful for his love for me. Oh, I'm a wretch. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My brothers and sisters, maybe there is a gift that you would like to give. Maybe there's an offering that you would like to give at this time. We ask that you would do that. The information is on the screen. Please give not grudgingly, but give cheerfully. These ministers preach from their hearts and we want to bless them on tonight. Please give tonight in this offering. We're asking that you would give sacrificially. Please give so that we may be a blessing to these ministers who have studied to show themselves approved and to declare God's word. Amen. We give an offering of thanksgiving on tonight. And so let us do that together. To God be the glory. Thank you so very much for your gift. As we conclude before the benediction, I'm going to give you just a couple of announcements. On Sunday, Scott A.M.E. Zion Church, located in Wilmington, Delaware, will come together for worship at 10 o'clock a.m. I'm asking that you would join me at 10 o'clock a.m. at Scott, and we will worship outdoor in the parking lot. And at 11 o'clock, we will have our typical virtual worship experience. So please don't forget about getting online. Come on online and let us meet you and see your face in cyberspace. But not only that, I'm asking that transformation meet me outside outdoors of the church on 702 Maple Parkway at 1230 because I am going to administer the Holy Communion. Please come on out. Both services uh, that are face to face will be dry then. This the service at Scott at 10 o'clock is a drive-in service. The service at 12:30 at Transformation is a drive-in service. Come on and let's fellowship again. Let's see each other's face and allow me to administer the communion unto you. For it is the first Sunday of the month, and so let us come together. I thank you in advance for your presence. And I praise God for your availability. Let us look to the Lord to be dismissed from this place, but never from his presence. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, to him have majesty, dominion, and power. Henceforth, now and forevermore, let the saints of God say amen, amen, amen. God bless you. And I'll see you on Sunday. Oh, 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 oh